a big portion of what we do in experimental dynamics is taking dynamical systems, and these dynamical systems could pretty much be anything. It could be buildings, bridges, a wing of an airplane, it could be anything, and system identifying them. And that means we take uh, this dynamical system and uh, somehow identify very important dynamical parameters which we could use to model that dynamical system with. And to do this, I'd like to go back to the idea of the frequency response function. Here I have an FRF, it's a HXY of F, and F here is any particular frequency. We have some sort of input, X of T, and some sort of output, Y of T. And uh, just a quick reminder on what a frequency response function is. Uh, it's pretty much defined as the frequency domain manifestations of the output signal divided by the frequency domain uh, manifestation of the input signal X. And we're going to write down frequency response function here. And really moving forward, we'll just refer to it as FRFs uh, because they have so much potential, really so much use in uh, this domain. Now, frequency response functions have tremendous applications in resonance analysis and the typical hammer impact analysis that are very common in the uh, experimental dynamics domain. So here I'm drawing this hammer, and these are scientific equipments that have sensors on them. Uh, these uh, impact hammers have uh, load cells on them, so whatever you hit this hammer with, you can also measure the input force that you are entering into that system. So this is like a load cell, and you can imagine I have a bridge that has uh, several sensors on it. Uh, these are three sensors, and a good example of a bridge sensor is an accelerometer. And uh, of course nowadays uh, all smartphones have accelerometers on board them, so we could actually use a smartphone for doing this kind of sensing. Okay, now that I know what my inputs and outputs look like, what I can do is to do frequency response function analysis. And there are two ways of doing this, the H1 and the H2. The H1 looks as follows. We have a fraction that has uh, this numerator. Uh, this X that I'm showing here is pretty much the Fourier uh, representation of my X signal, and I can do the same thing with Y. So I have X, and here it is. Now what I have in the numerator is called uh, cross-spectral density uh, because I'm comparing the frequency domain manifestations of X and Y. And in the denominator, what I have is called an auto-spectral density. And it's pretty much um, taking the same signal in frequency domain and multiplying it by itself. So we have cross-spectral density and auto-spectral density. And this is what H1 looks like. So here it is. And really uh, what H1 does is uh, this method is for uh, systems where the output of the um, dynamical system has noise as compared to the input. So the output has more noise than uh, what the input is expected to have. And here H is the dynamical system and X and Y are the input outputs and N is the noise. And uh, for H2 it's the opposite. Uh, we have, uh, again, this kind of uh, frequency domain manifestation. I'm going to draw. We have an auto spectral density in the numerator for the outputs. And here we have the following. And here it is. And really for H2, um, the difference is that the input is expected to be more noisy than the uh, output. And for systems where noise simply doesn't exist, uh, H1 and H2 are going to be matching. They're going to be equal. And this is uh, what we're going to have. So these uh, frequency response functions and these inputs and outputs are really important because we could use them to system identify and find some very important parameters about our uh, dynamical systems. So what I want to do now is to do an example and uh, this particular example that I'm going to do involves a three-story building. And here's an idealized model of the building. I have three masses. 
And so we have M1, M2, and M3. And um, what I'll do is I'll take a hammer, I'll go to the third story of my building and take a hammer and pretty much uh, impact, uh, introduce an impact force on the third floor. And, um, you know, there is a hammer blow that goes into the third floor. And I, uh, you can imagine I have three different sensors, one on each floor. We have S1, S2, and S3. And when I say sensors uh, for measuring uh, vibrations, I typically mean accelerometers. And uh, my input force uh, usually looks like this. It's an impulse, so we have time, we have uh, force, P of T, and because it's a hammer blow, it's just going to be a simple uh, impulse, um, and an impulse looks like this. It's pretty much like that. There it is. And it happens, we can say, at time zero. It's the moment the, the analysis starts. <laughs> Okay, so the third floor structure experiences a hammer blow and uh, all these uh, sensors start recording. And here I have the recordings from the first floor, second floor, and the third floor. And uh, I already know what my input looks like and these are my outputs. And really what I can do is I can take my inputs and then my outputs, convert them to frequency domain, and then uh, I can do some very cool frequency response function analysis. And that's something that we're going to do next. Okay, so I've taken my results uh, and I've converted them to frequency domain. And here I have the first of the frequency response functions. I have the second one. And we have HY2X and HY3X. So my input is X, my output is Y3. That's what I have. And I uh, on the top I have the amplitude plots and on the bottom I have the uh, phase plots. Now, the first thing I can do by looking at these plots is I can peak pick. Uh, what that means is I can look at my peaks and I can find what, what my uh, eigenvalues look like. I have omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3. And uh, <clears throat> I can simply look at my peaks and roughly estimate what my eigenvalues are. So the first natural frequency is 1.7 hertz. And uh, by the way, it doesn't matter which plot you use. You could use any of these. Uh, second one is 4.9 or 4.8. And the last one is uh, 6.9, I think. <clears throat> and again, this is an approximation. Uh, you could, uh, uh, you could uh, be more accurate than this with other methods. And uh, another thing we could do is uh, we could... Uh, also figure out what the mode shapes look like from the frequency response function. And so because we have a three-story, three-degree of freedom system, what I'm drawing is uh, three different structures which I'm gonna uh, draw the uh, mode shapes over. So I have uh, these modes and I'm doing mode shapes. Okay. Now, what I'll do is I'll go over to my face plots and I'll look at the first peak and I'll see that the first peak on the with the first output has 90 degrees phase angle, second one has 90, and the third one has 90. So all of them are in the same direction. And of course, this is representative of my first natural mode. And I'm going to draw it here. This is what it looks like. <coughs> this is mode 1. Now, with the second mode, I have to look at the second peak and look at the phase of the second peak. I have minus 90, minus 90, and I have 90. So, minus 90, minus, and plus. And this is the very generic way of drawing the second mode. And here it is. If you've taken Dynamics 1, you're already familiar with a lot of these uh, concepts. <laughs> and lastly, I'll do the same for mode 3. I have minus 270, so I'll just add uh, 360 to that. It'll give me 90. I have minus 90, and I have 90 again. And here, uh, the 90 has disappeared due to like the numerical uh, estimations that we're doing, but that's a safe 90. So here it is. We're going to draw my uh, third mode shape, and... Here it is. This is what it looks like. 
And also, if you're wondering how we are obtaining the amplitudes of these modes, uh, for identifying the amplitudes, uh, for example, if I'm wondering what the amplitudes of each of the nodes are on my mode one, I can simply look at the relative amplitudes of these, uh, these modes here. And uh, if I know the relative amplitudes, then I can draw my mode shape and have, a, ha have an accurate uh, amplitude for each floor. Okay, now that I have my eigenvalues and my mode shapes, what I can say is that my mass matrix is already known. Because think about it, anytime you have a building, you can easily estimate the mass of each floor. Uh, you know the density of the material, you know the volume, you can estimate the mass. So the mass matrix is known. I already know what my eigenvalues look like, and uh, I tend to use natural frequency and eigenvalue interchangeably, and I already know what the phi is. Phi 1, phi 2, and phi 3, these are, these are my mode shapes. And here it is. And um, if I know my mass matrix, the next logical step for me is to identify my modal mass matrix. So take the mass matrix and make it diagonal. So uh, MR is the modal mass matrix. It's phi transposed M phi. And of course, uh, the modal mass matrix uh, is a diagonal matrix that looks like this. We have uh, three elements in this particular case. And uh, what I can do is I can say uh, my modal stiffness matrix is a combination of my modal mass matrix and my eigenvalues. And pretty much I have KR, which is the modal stiffness matrix, is equal to MR omega squared. And this will give me a diagonal matrix that has the following shape. So when we began this process, we had no idea what the stiffnesses were like in this uh, three-story building. We simply used an impact uh, hammer, and uh, we used a couple of sensors. We identified the mode shapes, the eigenvalues, and we used this uh, uh, algebraic configuration here, development here, to identify our stiffness matrix, which is phi inverse transpose kr phi inverse. All right, see you next time.